what I really want to do right now is I want to share our, our sermon that we would normally do on a Saturday. I'm going to do it now via video so that we can still have our teaching and, and still be encouraged and still learn even though we're doing it together in a different way. So um, <clears throat> I want to start by sharing this opening story of um, uh, about zebras. The, when a mama zebra has her baby, a baby boy, the, the mama uh, really spends about two weeks or so or more, they spend quite a few weeks separated from the pack and uh, they're, they're just together, just the two of them. And there's a couple reasons for that. Number one, uh, the adult males uh, try to kill the babies. But number two, it's a time for them to come together and bond. Now their bonding is very unique. There's something that's very unique, unique about zebras. We know this, right? Like they have these stripes that are uh, horizontal on their body, vertical on their head. And the ones that are on their head are very unique. All, their, all the zebra stripes are, are unique to each individual zebra. There's no two zebra stripes that are alike. But the ones on their head are, are identifying marks that can be seen from further away. So when the baby is with uh, gets reintegrated back into the herd a few weeks after it's born and it starts to see its mom, it, it can identify its mom from far away. And those first couple weeks together are really important because they start to memorize the patterns on the head. And they also are, are the mom is speaking verbally, making sounds to the, the young calf and that's an identifier as well. So then when they're back in the herd and the 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 baby boy, the calf boy, is playing with his buddies, monkeying around, and either he looks up to make sure mama's still close, he can identify mama. Also, he might be able to hear mama from further away. Now, it's really important when an enemy comes in to attack the herd, it is very important for that baby zebra to be able to be protected by its mama, and it needs to know where mama is. So being able to identify visually through the stripes or audibly through sound where mama is so that it can be protected, especially when the enemy comes, is vitally important. And this is exactly what we're going to be talking about today with Paul. Paul has been called by God. He's been born again, and we see this in Acts chapter 9. When he's born again, he's a new creation. He's born new. He's essentially born as a baby new Christian. And he needs to be with God and spend time with God so he can identify who his father is. So as we dive in to Galatians chapter 1 verses 11 through 24, I want us to keep that story in mind of the zebra. This is what Paul says. You can read along with me in verses 11 through 24. For I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel was preached by me, the gospel that was preached by me, is not man's gospel. For I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus. For you have heard of my former life in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God violently, and I tried to destroy it. And as I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people, so extremely zealous was I for the traditions of my fathers. But when he who had set me apart before I was born, who called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son to me in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately consult with anyone, nor did I go up to Jerusalem, to those who were apostles before me. I went away into Arabia, and I returned to, again to Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to visit Cephas and remained with him 15 days. But I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. I'm In what I'm writing to you before God, I do not lie. I then went up to the regions to, of Syria and the Cilicia. And I was still unknown in person to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. They only were hearing it said that he who used to persecute us is now preaching the faith that he once tried to destroy. And they glorify God because of me. Well, first we need to see if you look at your notes. Um, Abby sent your notes, sent the notes to you. 
via email, so you should have those as well. Um, we see Paul's calling in verses 11 through 18. Paul was called by Jesus. And what we see, we need to first identify who is he addressing in Galatians. We, we said this last week, we need to say it again, that he's addressing his brothers in Galatia. These are the, the, the churches that Paul planted. We need to know this. We need to know that when we're living out our calling, <coughs> God grows his kingdom and God can use anyone when doing so, including Paul. And he's speaking to the Galatians, those who um, came to know Jesus through the churches that Paul planted. And he's reminding them that I used to be the one who hated the believers. And these are the men who are following Paul. And in other words, what we need to remember is that he can use anyone. God can use anyone. He can use you. He can use me. He can use us, whoever we are, wherever we're at, the lives that we used to live. But who are we today? That's the question. That's what Paul's showing them is, but this is who I am today. I'm not who I used to be. But he can use anyone. And this is the other question that we need to think about is, who will you be in 10 years in your faith, and who will God use you to preach to, to reach, to, to disciple? And that's something that, can you imagine when Paul first came to know Jesus, when he was planting these churches in Galatia, can you imagine that Paul would be used by God to write this amazing letter to not just the churches in Galatia, but how it would impact us as well? Imagine what God's going to do in and through our lives in the next 10 years as we follow Jesus and go and make disciples. So the next point that we see is that what is the gospel that Paul heard? Paul talks about, you know, hearing this gospel from Jesus. His message and his ministry, they were divinely given by Jesus alone. It wasn't from any man that he heard this information. He was on the road to Damascus. We see this in Acts chapter 9. Can you imagine when Paul met Jesus for the first time face to face on this road to Damascus? What was your first interaction? What was your Damascus interaction like with Jesus? I remember mine and it's such a powerful time for us to reflect and then Paul reminds us in 1 Corinthians 15 that anyone who adds to this gospel that Jesus gave me, if they add to it or change it, they're going to be judged. Why? Because this is the word of the Lord. This is God's word. This is his message that was divinely given by Jesus to Paul and that we can't mess with God's word. Paul then defends this position by reminding the Galatians about how God radically came into Paul's life, how he changed his course of life by 180 degrees. Paul was a new man, and because he was changed, he's saying, you can believe that the gospel message I have is from Jesus alone. It's not from my own being. It's not from other people. Because of my changed life, Look at the gospel message. The next thing we see is Paul's conversion story. Paul says that essentially I, I, I'm a former mobster. I, I, I was this younger, enthusiastic, zealous Paul named Saul. And I was part of killing Christians. He hated Christians. He was completely against them. Acts 9.1 says that Paul breathed threats and slaughter against the disciples of Jesus. He was loved in his circle of Judaism. He was very high up within it. He had power, knowledge, wisdom. He had relational clout with these other followers, with these other Jewish men. And he had all the degrees, he had all the fame, he had the he had everything. He had the it factor. That was Paul. And he used it for his benefit all the time. He was a, a mobster essentially. And he persecuted the church of Jesus to the point where he was part of killings like Stephen. 
the stoning of Stephen. He, he was a part of that. He, he was there and he approved of it. He was incredibly violent. Paul was, as a mobster to the Christian church. And he was moving up the ranks. His, his personal religious life and his, his being a scholar and his being a zealous, he was opposing all the religious. And he was moving up the ranks in his religiosity faster than anyone else his age. The Christians, though, they ran from Paul. They were afraid of Paul. They were terrified of Paul. They had no idea that this young rabbi would become a Christian. So Paul's crisis moment was on the road to Damascus. This crisis moment was an absolute miracle of God, just like your crisis moment and just like mine. John 6.44 says that God has ordained times like this where he draws people to his son Jesus and they're ordained by God the Father. They're set apart to be born again. That's what Paul said. I was set apart for this moment. Uh, and this is God's will. God's will, it says in 2 Peter 3, 9, that his will is that no one should perish, that not one should perish, that everyone should have eternal life. Paul was called by grace, by the grace of God alone. And what does it mean to be called by grace? How does grace call people? Well, as we said, God the Father draws people to his son Jesus. And then there's this massive change in our lives that's only from God. It's from God alone, and Paul experienced that. And then he's called into this acceptance by God. He's justified before God the Father. He's loved by the God of all creation. This justification has been imputed into his bank account so that his, his penalty has been paid and he's now been accepted by the, the God of all creation. And he's born again. He's a new creation. There's a mystery of God's sovereignty here. There's a mystery of of man's responsibility to obey God and fully submit his life through Jesus. He was called by grace, just as you were and just as I have been. And then on this road, Jesus himself, he reveals himself to Paul. He says that God was pleased to reveal Jesus to himself. Paul's saying that God was excited, he was joyful joyous to re reveal Jesus to Paul. In Galatians 1.14, it says that the Jews' religion had been an experience of outward rituals and practices, but faith in Christ is brought about by this inward change, this inward experience of reality with Jesus Christ. This inwardness of Christ was a major truth with Paul, and you see this throughout his epistles. And it was revealed to him at this moment on the road to Damascus. And then Paul says that God had a purpose for him. His purpose was to preach Jesus to all the Gentiles. Why would this be so far-fetched? It's, it's because the Jews didn't believe that the Gentiles were, were considered equal, that they would receive the same Messiah as they would. They, they didn't believe that they would ever be essentially equal with the Gentiles. So God cho chose Paul, a Jew, to preach to the Gentiles the same grace that, he, that God had for the Jews. And this in itself was evidence that Paul's conversion was of God because he, he was fighting against it. He was killing. He wanted to decimate the church of Jesus. This prejudice... Jewish rabbi would never decide on his own to minister the gospel of Jesus to the despised Gentiles. That's what makes this so unique. And this was Paul's initial crisis moment in his life, his coming to Jesus moment, if you will, the moment where his life collided with Jesus, the Messiah, and he was changed forever and always. And we are as well as we've experienced the same crisis 
in our lives as we committed our lives to Jesus and said yes to following him all the days of our lives. And after this moment on the, Dam the Damascus Road, he, he went away to Arabia to simply spend time with God. He was with God for three years in Arabia. So in verses 18 through 20, we see that Paul goes and he spends this, this time alone with God. What's interesting is that the 12 apostles, they spent three years with Jesus, and now Paul is going and spending three years alone with God through Christ as he studied the word and he prayed with Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit. And during this time, Paul grew in his faith. He was understanding the heart of God. And anyone, the scripture says that anyone who lives on milk alone, he still is an infant. He, hasn't acquaint, he has not been acquainted with the teachings about righteousness, but solid food is for the mature, who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. That's in Hebrews 5, 13 and 14. Paul was spending three quality years with Jesus, growing in his maturity, chewing on meat, and he was constantly using the word, constantly using his time with God to be trained so that he could be distinguished and he could also distinguish good from evil, that he could follow God's ways, not his ways or, or the world's ways or Satan's ways. And because of this growth, Paul was gaining this amazing understanding. He was being prepared to give answers to people who had questions about this radical transformation, about who Jesus Christ is. Now, more than likely, we can say that Paul probably also did some evangelism during that time, during those three years. Uh, Acts 9, 19 through 20 says that Paul spent some time in Damascus before he actually went to Arabia for those three years. So I'm sure that he had this time where he was um, evangelizing and sharing the good news of Jesus, his transformation with other people. Now this time of being alone with God is so similar to what the story that we heard earlier about the zebras, how they spend time with, with their mom. They, you know, we, we need to spend time with God. We need to spend time so we can know him, identify him, hear his voice, be able to identify his voice from all the other voices in our lives, be able to identify who he is so that we could follow him all the days of our lives, especially when danger comes at us. Danger is coming at us all the time. The enemy is always trying to steal, kill, and destroy. And what we're seeing here is that we need to spend time alone with God especially those formative years when we first come to know Jesus are so critically important to really spend time in the Word, to know God, to identify Him, to be able to hear His voice. So then Paul goes back to Damascus. In your notes, after he leaves Arabia, he goes back to Damascus. And then from Damascus, he goes to Jerusalem. And then in Damascus, it says in Acts 9, verses 19 through 25, this was a very dangerous, tumultuous time for Paul when he went back to Damascus. He, he, he was surrounded by these people, these Jewish leaders who wanted to kill him. They were so angry that this was, Paul, Saul, he, he was our dude. He was the one leading the other Jews in the revolt against the Christian church. He was the one leading and, and saying, let's decimate the Christian church. Now he comes back to Damascus, and he's a changed man. He's new. He is a follower of Jesus, and they hate him. They are seething with anger. And this one experience in Acts chapter 9, it really sheds light on the validity of Paul's true life-changing experience with Jesus on the road to Damascus. The next thing we see in verses 18, to be in fellowship with other people. You know, Paul went back to Jerusalem to be in fellowship with the apostles. He went to be there. He spent 15 days with Cephas. He also found James, the brother of Jesus, when he was in Jerusalem. Acts 9, verses 26 through 28, tell us that Paul had a, had a hard time when he went back to Jerusalem because even the, the, the other apostles, they feared him. As he was going, they thought that he was going to kill him because that's who he used to be. 
So Paul was struggling, and he wanted this, this fellowship, but even being in fellowship it was a hard time for him. But what, what Paul was doing was wanting to live with those that he had a common DNA with, and, and that's really what we're called to do in the church as well. And then a little sidebar here, we're also called to not only live in community, live in fellowship with one another, but to be discipled and to be discipling others. We're called to that. We see that in Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 2. And then in verses 21 through 23, Paul fulfills God's calling for his life. He preaches to the Gentiles. Paul leaves Jerusalem because of how dangerous it was for him as people were starting to attack him, not the apostles, but the other Jews. And so Paul went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia, which was really, these were his home, like his home region. The, if you were to break the world up into regions, this was really more of his region where he came from. And we're called to go and make disciples just like Paul was in Matthew 28 and 2 Timothy 2. Now, it says, the scripture says that he was not known initially when he went into these regions of, of Syria and Cilicia. But when the word spread about who Paul used to be and who he is now, people immediately believed in Jesus because of this amazing life change that Paul had due to his relationship with Jesus on the road to Damascus, people followed Jesus because of Paul's life change. They weren't following Paul, but they were following the king because of Paul's life. And then verse 24 says that God was glorified because of all these things. He was glorified because of the life transformation that Paul experienced, but he was also glorified because of the life experience of other people as well because of what God did through Christ in Paul's life. So what's your purpose? What's my purpose in our faith journey? There's a couple things that we take from these passages from this section in Galatians chapter 1. The first thing is that we're to love God and love others well. Matthew 22 verses 34 through 40. They were asking Jesus, what's the most important law to follow. And Jesus says to love God and to love your neighbor as yourself, to love others well. The second thing we see is that we're to grow in our faith. You know, milk is good for the early months, but it's not good as you continue to get older. You need to eat real protein, real fruit. You need the fiber. You need all these things so that your bones can get stronger, so you can start crawling and start walking and then start um, growing and then your muscles grow and they get stronger. So you need meat. And the same is true in our lives spiritually. We need to dive into scripture and spend lots of time with Jesus. We need to be discipled by one another. We need guys who've gone before us, who are, who are further ahead than us in our faith journey. We need them to reach down and grab us and, and walk alongside us and teach us about how to live the Christ life. And as we get stronger in our faith and as we grow in maturity we need to do the same thing so now we're holding that other dude's hand who's walking us through life and now we're reaching down and guys we need to do that in men's ministry that's you know the being in a table environment living together in this community on Saturdays that's really what it's about and and this week we're, we're, we're doing this differently aren't we but man guys you can do this with the guys at your table right now, you can reach out to them. You can shoot them a text and just say, how, how are you doing? You know, or give them a call and ask them. You can have a cup of coffee with them. Do, do those things so that you can still stay connected and live in that discipleship model. And the reason is because we are. We're called to grow beyond where we're at today. We should not stay stagnant in our faith. We need to grow beyond the elementary teachings about Jesus and be taken forward in our maturity, this scripture say in Hebrews 6. We need to go deeper in our understanding of theology. We need to go deeper into our understanding of God's word in, 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 you know, in prayer, in community, in worship. We need to be prepared in season and out of season for those times when people ask us the hard questions about our faith. And then we need to be in fellowship. We need to be discipled. That's what the scripture says. That's the next point, the purpose in our life. So we need to love God, love others. We need to grow in our faith. And then we need to be in fellowship and be discipled as we just talked. He told, he told Timothy that 
we need to have believers living this way out in the church. We need to have believers in 2 Timothy 2 verses 1 through 4. It talks about uh, entrust to reliable men the, the word of God. So we're training others and they train others and they train four generations of spiritual discipleship going on there. And that's one thing that I would love to see grow in our men's ministry. I'd love to see our men go deeper in this. And we do have plans for this for the fall to talk more about that. And then the next point we see here is that we can go and make disciples. So be in fellowship, be discipled, but then go and make disciples. Matthew 28, 2 Timothy 2. And a part of this is evangelism, sharing the gospel, Matthew 24, 14. A part of growing in our faith is knowing the gifts that God has for us. This is our next point. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 12, Romans 12, and Ephesians 4, it talks about the spiritual gifts that the Holy Spirit gives us. And do you have, what, what gifts do you have that can bless the congregation, that can bless the body of Christ? God calls us to go and serve. So to love one another, to love God and love one another, to go and make disciples, to grow in your faith, and to serve one another, to serve the body of Christ through our gifts. So the question is, what is God, what's God's calling in your life? How is he going to use those gifts? How is he going to use you in fellowship? The thing that we need to do is ask God, Lord, what is it that you want for me? Lord, what is it that you want me to step into? How do you want me to serve? How do you want me to use the gifts once we determine what they are? How do you want me to use those gifts? Pray and ask others. Step out and, and take a chance and serve somewhere. Don't just sit back and get comfortable in our faith or, or, or be gluttonous with God's word. He calls us to, 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 to act out our faith, to, to put our faith into action would be a better way to say that. So the question is, have you had this call and will you fulfill the call that God has in your life? Will we do those things? Will we step into it? Only time will really tell. Maybe you have. Maybe you've started doing that. Maybe you've stepped into it. And for those things, uh, God is glorified. That's the last thing is that God gets the glory in all that we do, all that we uh, participate in. God gets the glory. It's not about us. It's not about how amazing we are, how gifted we are. God gifted us anyway. So he gets the glory for all that happens in and through us for the sake of the gospel. So what's your story? Have you had this crisis moment in your life like Paul did? Have you started to live out the progressive sanctification? Romans 8 is progressive sanctification. Romans 6 is all about the, the potential we have as followers of Jesus. Romans 7, 14 through 24 is all about, you know, I, I still stink. Uh, what a wretched man I am. And then Romans 8 is by the power of the Holy Spirit, you can truly experience that potential we see in Romans 6. And when we do, what happens? Romans 12, we have the transformed life, the transformation of the mind so that you can live out the calling that God has for you in your life. And when, when we as sinners, when we trust Jesus, we are born again like Paul. We are saints at that point. Paul, he was born again on the road to Damascus. You and I, have had that same experience. He's been redeemed. He's been purchased by Jesus. He gets to know God, just like the young zebra did, by spending time with God for those th first three years in Arabia. And then when we do that, when we spend time with God, when we spend time with Him, get to know Him, be able to identify Him, be able to identify His voice, we no longer live in bondage to sin, to Satan, to the ways of the world. Or to the human religiosity, the human religious system. We no longer have to live bondage, live in bondage that we can be free. We are born free. We can live free because of Jesus. If the, if the Son shall make you free, you are free indeed. That's so true in our lives when we follow Jesus and we put him first. We are called to go and make disciples. May we live out our calling to go and make disciples so that God can be glorified, his kingdom can grow, and we can know him even greater. Live in your freedom today, fellas. 
see you either next week or we'll do video again. We'll keep you updated as to what's going on on a weekly basis. But as for now, for this week, for this Sunday, uh, that's what we'll be doing. We'll uh, may God uh, just give you great um, health. May God continue to bless you. And may you continue to grow in who you are in Christ. Live free.